Um, so Gabe had asked me to give a talk today um, uh, to talk about some of the ways that we um, facilitate a very early integration of um, an engagement of regulators, industry, and stakeholders um, into uh, the Strategic Salmon Health Initiative project, which we started a couple of years ago, and why this early integration was absolutely essential to the success of the program. So. This is a bit of an unusual project in that really the initial project drivers were um, the recommendations from, from a judicial inquiry. Uh, there was a Cohen inquiry um, investigating the role of, of many different factors in declining productivity in Fraser River sockeye salmon. Uh, this was a, a, a pretty publicized inquiry um, and quite controversial. And um, there was a lot of scientific debate over the, the almost year of hearings that went on. However, there were two different sectors that, or two different factors that really created a lot of scientific debate and a lot of public interest. And those were when they were debating the potential <laughs> issue of infectious disease and the potential interactions with aquaculture fish. And um, in the end, um, in the recommendations of the inquiry, there were a number of recommendations that were um, towards uh, what the department, the DFO, which is where I work, um, should be doing in terms of research um, directions, but, but um, there were at least three that were highly relevant to the program that we eventually developed, which basically suggested that there was a need for research into novel technological approaches to determine the role of infectious diseases on wild salmon declines and the potential for transmission between aquaculture and wild fish. One of the things that really came out of the inquiry and the, and, and the hearings in, in the disease um, and there were about four days dedicated to just the role of the potential role of diseases that we really didn't understand what diseases may be affecting wild fish because typically people who work in the area of fish health work with dying animals and, and for the vast majority of the salmon life cycle we don't observe mortality. When they're in the ocean, mortality is not an observable event. So it's very difficult to take a traditional disease approach where you're diagnosing dying animals and figuring out what killed them. You have to sample presumably healthy animals and, 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 and determine um, the role of disease, which is a much, much more difficult task. 
there was the other thing that really became apparent during these various hearings was that there was an extreme lack of trust between the public, the environmental non-governmental organizations, the industry, and I'm talking both the, the salmon farming industry as well as the wild commercial um, industries, the industry regulators, which are DFO for the most part, uh, but also the Canadian Food Inspection Agency when it comes to regulatory diseases, um, and that that the fact that there was so much lack of trust and controversy really dictated that if we were going to develop a program of research to try to resolve some of these issues, that we needed to be very careful to have very strong scientific transparency from the beginning, to have very a very clear communication strategy and, and, and networks of, of communication with various end user groups, and very early engagement of stakeholders, end users, and regulators. If we were going to get buy-in, from all of these different groups that, that didn't really have a lot of trust. So um, while the Cohen Commission was going on, we, we began um, um, discussions uh, with Brad Popovich here at GNOBC um, and the Pacific Salmon Foundation, Brian Riddle, who's actually the project lead, and myself from DFO. And we talked about what are some of the ways that we can integrate genomic technology to be able to resolve some of the, some of the questions um, pertaining to the role of infectious disease in wild salmon declines. What we came up with, with was really taking fish health research um, and flipping it around. So instead of starting with um, dying animals, we asked the question, what microbes do wild fish um, um, in BC carry? Um, and so we went to a, a range of, of, of diseases and, and, and literature into the important diseases that are occurring in salmon all over the world and we have developed a platform where we can assess with quantitative PCR over 45 microbes that are known or suspected to, to associate with diseases in salmon all over the world. And, and then we're basically taking these and using a funnel approach where, where we are looking at a variety of different metrics, starting with microbe monitoring, then, through, then going through epidemiological studies, doing whole genome sequencing and looking at transmission dynamics, looking at physiological assessments, functional genomics and proteomics, cellular impacts with histopathology and organismal impacts, um, looking at behavior and survival in natural systems. And we're, we're going basically from the discovery of which microbes are actually present in BC because a lot of microbes associated with emerging diseases in salmon throughout the, throughout the world have never even been studied in British Columbia. Um, and then trying to de determine which ones are the most important to, to then carry through disease challenge research to look at cause and effect relationships with disease. So the, the novel technology that, that we brought forward for this was a microfluidics micro, a micro monitoring platform for which we have um, duplicate quantitative PC assays, PCR assays for 46 salmon microbes that can be run across 96 samples at once. And this is basically in the background is a heat map that shows um, the brighter the colors, the, the, the higher the load of the microbe, and it shows duplicate assays with the assays in the horizontal direction and the samples um, in, the, in the vertical direction. And so with this monitoring platform, um, we, we included on the platform 25% of the microbes that were not known to be endemic to disease, or to, to BC. This, this created even more controversial with the regulators and, 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 and the aquaculture industry because no one had ever studied these here and there was a lot of concern over what we might find because we didn't know what we might find. Um, as well, seven of the microbes that we have on this platform are reportable to the Canadian Food Infection Agency. They're OIE listed diseases. And, and that was also controversial. So to look at regulatory diseases in a research context and not in a diagnostic context um, there was a lot of concern by the CFIA over that. So because of the concerns of my own department, um, as well as the CFIA and the aquaculture industry, over what we might find with this platform, um, the, they insisted that we go through a, very, a formal review process of the platform once it was developed um, to ensure that the analytical results were sensitive, specific, repeatable, and comparable to other platforms. One of the issues that was of great concern for instance, the CFIA was that, that, in, in, it, well, in, that this platform was actually a little bit more sensitive than other platforms, so that we could detect a lower copy number than the platforms being implemented in the diagnostic labs. Um, and that was not seen as positive. Um, and so 
uh, the, this formal CSAS process um, what we just undertook last December, and we basically had international researchers from diagnostic labs all over the world, including France and Japan and the US and Canada, um, come and evaluate um, a, a very large report we did, about a 100-page report, um, in which we had done 335,000 qPCR reactions to do, the anal to do the analytical validation of the platform. And um, we looked at the limit of detection, the specificity of the assays, the repeatability, comparability, and the sensitivity of the, there's a pre-amplification step, that was the, the part that really concerned a lot of people because, uh, be, be, because the, you're only amplifying um, you know, the wells that you're amplifying are only seven nanoliters, so you have to do a pre-enrichment step, which most genomic technologies um, require. Fortunately, um, we did very well in, in, in this process, and the platform performs exceedingly well um, and, and, and um, was determined through this process to be fit for research purpose. The next step ultimately will be to take it through diagnostic performance, but having this under our belt allowed us to move forward into the research phase. So for tra scientific transparency, we had a lot of discussions about this in the early development of the, pro of the program and, and determined that basically we need to, need to be very careful about the composition of our research team so that none of the members of our research team had a vested interest in the BC aquaculture industry or in, in environmental, non-governmental agencies with an anti-aquaculture mandate. Because again, a lot of the controversy really lay around that debate over what's the role of aquaculture in the transmission of disease. And a lot of people in the public believe that all diseases come from cultured animals, which, which we know scientifically not to be the case. But it was very important that there, this wasn't mandate-driven science, that the science was driving the results that we had. So we ended up with a, a team of 18 members from Canada, the US, and Europe, and we actually um, attracted most of our veterinarian experts from other parts of the world other than BC because we didn't want veterinarians that already work with the industry in BC. So targeted end users, there's a lot of targeted end users of this. There's, there's not only the information that, that will be generated, but there's also the platform um, that, that we're generating. Fisheries Notions, obviously where I work, um, there are a number of different groups who would be end, end users of the information and the technology, including fisheries and aquaculture management and policy developers, salmon enhancement, um, these are the enhancement hatcheries, um, as well as the Aquatic Animal Health Program. The Pacific Salmon Commission actually co-manages many of the fisheries here, and so they are another fisheries management group who would be end users of this information. The Canadian Food Inspection Agency, which is regulatory control for OIE um, reg reportable diseases. The platform itself is, is a potential, uh, they would be an end user of that platform if they wish to use it for diagnostic purposes for the OIE reportable diseases. The uh, aquaculture industry, um, Obviously, again, the end user of the platform, but also the, the um, information. And, and what I didn't say in the beginning was uh, the program is actually looking at wild fish, aquaculture fish, and um, enhancement hatchery fish for the very first time. Nowhere in the world has anybody looked at all three of those groups of fish at once to really understand disease processes in, in all of them. Um, and then diagnostic laboratories are, are obviously being targeted for downstream translation, especially for the industry. Then sort of um, secondary end users are these ENGOs who are very interested in this project. Um, the pu public and media, there's been a lot of um, public and, and, and media associated with it. Wild fisheries associations um, and sports fisheries associations. So in terms of clear communication and early engagement, we invited, before we even had a project, we um, worked Genome BC and Pacific Salmon Foundation uh, basically devised a panel of public, a public interest panel, we originally called a stakeholder panel that ultimately evolved to a public interest panel, with representatives of various different groups who have some, um, some connection with salmon. Um, and so this is a listing, many of, the, many of the organizations that I already talked about. This group was called to basically help us determine the information needs that were important to the stakeholders and end users to assist with the development of, the str of a strategy to effectively communicate research outcomes. So we, we discussed the various different results along the way with them and talk about how to communicate that effectively so that the public understands what you can and can't say about, uh, about the application of that information 
um, at various stages of development, and also to identify ways to apply outcomes to management. This group meets every, every six months and, and receives a report from our program, and we discuss those kind of challenges with them. Um, in terms of clear communication, another group that was formed was the DFO Project Management Steering Committee. There's, because DFO is a major end user, it's also a major developer of this program, it was very important that upper managers in DFO be kept in the loop on, on, all, the, on the, all of the findings, but also um, that, they, that we facilitate review and departmental sign-off on each phase, because in the very first phase of a project, it took almost a year to get DFO to sign off on it. They were very nervous about this project. And so having this, having this kind of upper management team has, has really helped us um, speed some of that process up. But this group is also discussing the communication strategies because communication is probably the, um, the, the, the biggest concern um, by the department. And, uh, and then we also need to determine when briefing notes at the deputy minister um, level are required. Interestingly, after the CSS process, we were finally able to get the Canadian Food Inspection Agency to the table. They wouldn't really come to the table until we'd actually gone through that formal review. But that CSAS made a big difference in terms of, of bringing both, the, both regulatory agencies to the table. So ensuring proper data interpretation and communication, this is also paramount. We're, we're looking at over 45 different salmon microbes that, are, that have the carry potential to cause disease. And there's a lot of concern that what does it actually mean? We know a qPCR isn't doesn't really, is not a disease, right? So how do we actually um, have a context of, uh, behind the kind of results that we're that we're generating? So we formed two different kinds of committees. One, a context um, advisory committee. This is made up of um, veterinarians from various different aquaculture um, companies. Um, as well as fisheries biologists that are out in the field and understand a lot about the stocks that we're working with, um, and people from the salmon enhancement program, and they provide the context between here's, a, here's the findings that we're having, here's some of our observations, how do these relate to things that you know to be happening in the field? Uh, the other one is an organism, organism expert committee. And this, even though we have 18 scientists involved in this program, we cannot cover off the full range of expertise for 45 different um, potential pathogens. And so this, this organism expert committee kind of fills in the gaps for, with researchers who understand some of the ones who are, do research on some of the pathogens that are not within the realm of our project team. So the positive results we've seen, received from early engagement, and I should say that we're, this is an ongoing project. We're, we're really on, in only the second phase of four phases. Um, for, in terms of diagnostic laboratories, we already are beginning um, to develop translational activities. Um, we were being contacted by various diagnostic labs about whether they could use this information or whether we could extend this to um, salmon in other parts of the world. Um, and we, we are look, interested in working on full diagnostic validations in the future with these labs. And um, in terms of regulators, as I said, the CSAS was a real turning point for the CFIA and DFO support. They are now comfortable with the platform, comfortable with the results that will come out of this platform, and they're both at the table. And, and this has gone through ministerial level briefing um, on multiple steps along the way. Uh, the industry, we have a material transfer agreement with the salmon aquaculture industry for them to provide fish. We have engagement um, with the national um, salmon aquaculture representatives now on a regular basis. And we are now developing a platform that's very similar to this for shellfish um, aquaculture industry. Um, we also have hatchery managers um, at the table and we're working with the hatcheries directly. And um, public and the NGOs have continued um, interest and support, and we're highly engaged with First Nations who are actually sometimes very hard to engage with, but they actually come to us because they're really, really interested in, um, in the program and the information that comes out of it. And that's, 